welcome to Active Hope number seven. We've done seven events with Joanna Macy and uh, a variety of well-known celebrity speakers speaking with her. Harvey Wasserman's back for the second uh, Active Hope event. He did one earlier and he didn't get arrested. Uh, and I want to thank the fellowship for uh, allowing us to have this tonight in their venue. Uh, this is the most important thing you can be doing tonight, and I say that without hesitation. <laughs> this is what we are challenged with. El Diablo. And I just want you to consider for a minute how you would challenge the devil. And what I've come up with after thinking about it a really long time is sympathy for the devil. And what does that mean to you? Think about that for a minute if you want to, or just, should we fight the devil? I mean, do we have as much power as the devil? Or, or can we be angels? And the devil was an angel, wasn't he? Lucifer, sitting at the right hand of God, and uh, fallen from grace, and having to do a job that I'm thinking the devil doesn't even really enjoy. I don't think the devil enjoys the job, and I think that we're going to help the devil have an epiphany. And that's my challenge to you, is to think about what that epiphany would look like for you in your life to help that devil have an epiphany and to bring that devil to the light. That's my challenge to you. Come on up, Joanna. This is the seventh event we've done together and um, I can't tell you how grateful I am to Joanna for for helping us through these times. How many of you were here at a previous Act of Hope? Shoot up your hands. Okay, I see that quite a few, well, welcome back. And I see that there, some of you were here for the first Act of Hope. So let me say a word about it. So Act of Hope is number one, the name of a book. Here it is. Its title in full is Active Hope, How to Face the Mess We're In Without Going Crazy. And this came out with um, New World Library, uh, authored by myself and the wonderful Chris Johnstone, who lives in Scotland. And we were able to bring this off together because we've worked together over almost 20 years, 30 years. <laughs> He's a physician who specializes in uh, addictions, which is very appropriate for social change today. Do you not think so? Yes. And uh, has worked with me uh, ever since 1989 in the work that reconnects. And we wanted to have a book. This is also a little comedy scene that we don't rehearse, but it sort we of can't comes. hear you. That's why I did that, I'm sorry. Okay. Oh, and all this time you don't have a clue what I was saying. Oh, and I was saying such dirty jokes. Oh, oh. <laughs> any rate, uh, so Active Hope is a book, and it's a book that has played quite a role around the world. It's got its following in Japan, whose where the name is Akutiva Hopu, and, and in Spanish, uh, and in uh, French and German in Europe and down in South America. And it's coming out in Portuguese because our friends in Brazil have a tough fight, don't you think? Mm. So uh, it's also 
uh, you say, well, what's active hope? And it's what sets us on fire to do what our hearts want us to do, regardless of what we, whether we think that it's likely uh, whether things look hopeful. So it kind of fits with what Cynthia was saying about dancing with the devil, because things in, the tw in 2020 are super challenging. And so we can't afford to wait around to things feel as if they're going our way and we'll just waltz with it. Here we jump to action with active, be following what we want, what the best intention is, whether or not it looks hopeful or likely. And this is liberating. It's. Uh, based in the Buddha's teachings, and it also is based in the way life works. And it is based on the remarkable fact that we are gifted with the capacity to make a choice. And we can choose what we're going to do tonight, what we're going to do with our lives, what we're going to do. And this moment is very good for living in a time of great uncertainty. Because uncertainty, while it robs you of any assurance of what you're going to do in the future or postpone, it forces you to be totally present to the present moment. That's all you have. And in this present moment is where you can act. In this present moment is where you can follow and bring what you believe in your dreams into reality. Not tomorrow and certainly not yesterday. So in most of the evenings up till now, it, we've had, and all of them, a pattern that Cynthia, paper master, has cooked up that I just love. And that is that it brings a, quite a number of issues together with their promote, proponents speaking them out. I love that. So it's, we get a sense of what a number of people are doing. But also it has a focus on one topic. And today, uh, tonight, the focus is on nuclear energy. And I am very excited because we've got a remarkable number of people right here. We're going to have a panel with them, along with when we also are listening to Emma's revolution and these other issues that we're going to have looking at. What about closing Diablo Canyon now, this year? Is this not the time to do that? Yes. And they will show why it is and how it is. And somehow that concatenation of all the others that's coming up now is very exciting to me. And it's exciting uh, because I want to tell you that uh, nuclear energy has been like a leitmotif for me, if that's the right word, of my life. It played a role in changing, a turning point in my life and changing the direction of it that brought me here and changed my life from uh, being in a, uh, halls in the Ivy Tower of a university and uh, doing the teaching I wanted, and with surrounded by adoring students, and oh, and I would be sitting, I would be there, and uh, the hubble de bubble of, of marching and protests and cooking up uh, plans to overthrow this or that, and <laughs> <laughs> with uh, and and what th that happened was that while I was in graduate school, now this was, was like 44 years ago, and I was about 44, but I'm, I'm older than 88, because I know you can add. 
And, uh, but there, uh, our son, I was preparing for this university life and looking forward to it greatly. But then our son Jack came back from his first freshman year at Tufts with a paper and he said, I thought you'd like to see this and I looked at it and I said, oh, I'm sure and I'll look at it. Mm. And then I looked at it and it was about thermal pollution of nuclear reactors. It wasn't even radioactive pollution. It was just thermal pollution. How across the country, in the coastal waters, into the rivers, into the streams, that water that the nuclear power plant needs to keep running through to cool off its overheatedness um, was uh, having a, a terrible effect on the plant life and especially the aquatic life, the, the fish. I read that. I couldn't believe it. I said, Jack, this could not be happening. If this were happening, the sports people and the fishing people, they would be out, and the plant biologists and the aquatic biologists, they would be out on the streets. This can't be happening. Well, it was. So there was a double mystery. Why were people doing something so insane as this, affecting our ecology in such an avoidable way? And why was it being OK with the majority of the American public? Why was everybody quiet about it? So that has been a, a sort of a question that's followed me for the last 44 years. What, why do we put up with this, particularly when you turn not only to the thermal pollution, but to the radioactive contamination, and to the lethal radioactive wastes that last up to hundreds of thousands of years, and even millions of years when it comes to uh, depleted uranium and others, uh, yeah. So uh, I found myself within weeks getting into training, nonviolence training, to be able to prepare. Jack was going with the Clamshell Alliance. Do you remember the times of the Clamshell Alliance here? Any of you and the alliances and, and the trainings you went through? And those trainings were developed but at the Movement for a New Society in Philadelphia, and that this was the, the so creative that this was the germ, the, the basic form that nonviolence has taken, training has taken ever since. Well, there I was doing that too. And there we were together occupying Seabrook Reactor. Now, this was a reactor being built in New Hampshire, right on the coast. And I knew what would happen to the coastal waters after those studies. And then one thing led to another. And I was pretty soon working for, uh, as a volunteer on my extra time, now Ralph Nader's critical mass. Anybody remember that? Hmm, yes, that was. And in that, we were. Um, organizing a people's lawsuit. It was called a legal intervention against a power plant to windward of our home in Washington, D.C. And there was this group I joined. Now this uh, plant, nuclear power plant, was called North Anna. And it was, we needed to sue it because they were putting the racks of the fuel rods too close together in the storage pools. The regulations that have been established, you have to follow them, they says the government and the health uh, scientists, or you risk the danger of criticality. If they get too close together, you might they might ignite and have a problem. So, in order to save money, the plant was cutting corners. 
This is happening up, down, and sideways all over the country, I soon discovered. We lost this, our, our lawsuit, but I wasn't deterred one little bit. I learned that the nuclear industry was being running the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and most of the safeguards that and Congress that were keeping that anything that would get in the way of their uh, making the profits that they wanted to make with these enormous expensive boondoggles. And now I read just recently, and you may remember the name of Gregory Yasko. He was the chair of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission um, at the time of Fukushima. And you remember, how many of you were here, remember where you were with, at the time of Fukushima? And how many of you remember that the plants were American plants, American-built reactors? How many of you knew that? And you're not surprised that when the news hit the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and they shuddered thinking, oh, this will give a bad name to nuclear power, they were saying, well, it's because it's nothing to do with that. They didn't mention it. These were American uh, plants, which were crazy. You might have seen that with the way they're built uh, over there. The, but it's because of the Japanese culture, you know. The Japanese are not as efficient as we are. <laughs> and they didn't handle things well. And they're so, they, they're so timid or something. They, so this is what Gregory Yasko was facing as the chair uh, of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. And he was new, he was, didn't come, he was the first one who'd ever not come from the industry. He wrote this wonderful book, came out this year, uh, about his experience, Confessions of a Rogue Nuclear Commissioner. And he talked about what it was like trying to help the American industry and public understand from Fukushima what we needed to do to, for nuclear safety here as well as around the world. And it was a, uh, he was defeated. They got a report written that really did detail, they got a blue ribbon 90 day, uh, report written, and that they've, but they um, managed to um, get it into the hands of the commissioners, the other commissioners, before he wanted to, never got, it never was made public. And then he was asked to resign, which he did with a feeling of great grief as you can imagine, for having allowed that uh, to happen. So it looks like we have one of the most lethal and expensive industries in the world in history that wants to keep on going. And it seems that uh, they have a conviction that they want to persuade the American public that with climate change, nuclear energy is the way to go. I'm sure you've heard quite a bit about that. They feel that these, uh, we should be grateful to nuclear energy for its capacity to uh, generate electricity without um, generating also uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Well, that may be true once it starts. 
But I bet you've wondered, as I have, what about all the huge volume of greenhouse gas emissions every step of the way of making those nuclear reactors? From the mining and the milling, all the way up the nuclear fuel chain, all the construction, all of that is generating huge amounts of CO2. You can believe it. But then, uh-oh, we forget about that. We'll turn on the switch and see. Now we're, we're arriving, now we're doing this. And let's say nothing of the time or expense. I know that I'm getting tired of this kind of talk, and more and more Americans are too. And so I'm just thrilled that uh, there are these thinkers like Harvey and Seeley and uh, Mr. Giesman, I haven't met you yet, so I don't say your name right, uh, who are here to um, s help us get smart and, uh, and com convinced of what we can do to show the country and, and to show the world We've had enough of this now. We're not going to even wait till 2025. We're going to close it down now. Yay.